Holland. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to come to speak to you again today uh, at this meeting. Um, thanks for the kind introduction. So I'm a emergency physician by trade uh, and a cardiac arrest researcher, and I'm going to chat today a little bit about ECBR for out of hospital cardiac arrest. So I don't have any industry funding, however, we have received some Lucas devices from Physio Control on loan for our uh, ECPR protocol in Vancouver. So with that in mind, I thought we'd start with one, one picture that you might have seen before to show you how far we've really come uh, with innovative cardiac arrest innovations. And you can see here our early resuscitative pioneers demonstrating <laughs> the infamous tobacco smoke enema treatment. One of the earliest dates of using this innovative therapy is 1976, where this woman was miraculously revived with this technique. Think about that when you see your next ECMO case report. <laughs> so back to the ta task at hand, ECPR for out of hospital cardiac arrest. I'm gonna review some background. We'll discuss the potential effectiveness of ECPR, risks of harm, how we went about setting up a protocol in Vancouver, and then a few questions for the future in this field. So first, some background. I'm sure you all know about what ECMO is. Uh, ECPR uses a veno-arterial form of ECMO, which is cardiopulmonary bypass, when we implement it on a patient undergoing active chest compressions, we call it ECPR. ECPR for out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, the patient has a cardiac arrest in the community, brought to hospital with CPR, then cannulation with CPR ongoing. So this provides an additional potential option for patients who have refractory cardiac arrest in the community. So back to out-of-hospital cardiac arrest statistics, this is a line that you typically see at the beginning of every single out-of-hospital cardiac arrest manuscript ever written. The out-of-hospital cardiac arrest is common, but with poor survival from hospital discharge. Thus, the results of this particular study should be published immediately. It was based on the same acknowledgement of low survival that we felt inspired to develop the ECPR protocol in Vancouver. We thought we'd be heroes with nothing to lose based on the low survival statistics of cardiac arrest. The hopes of improving the low survival of this disease state was inspiring. However, things always turn out to be a bit more complex than you originally think. So I'm gonna tell, tell you what we do know for sure about ECPR for out of hospital cardiac arrest. It's really cool. The concept of taking a patient with a refractory out of hospital cardiac arrest to hospital, putting them on the cardiopulmonary bypass, definitely a cool concept. Everyone loves it. Number two, it's really, really cool. But then things get more complicated. It's logistically extremely difficult. Trying to take a pro trying to develop a program, train paramedics, nurses, physicians, and finally implementing it over a large health region to treat about one patient per month. It's definitely a lot of work and worth thinking about. It's resource intensive. For the number of patients, for the individual patients involved, it's resource intensive and also extremely resource intensive to develop and maintain a system of rapid response for a relatively few number of patients. We know that some people survive after ECPR therapy and that's what inspires us to pursue this treatment modality. Of course, similar to other critically ill patients, there are possible complications with these patients. So let's review some of the evidence. There have been lots of studies published reporting the outcomes of patients treated with ECPR. In fact, the literature is full of them now, all retrospective or prospective, a small selection of which are listed here, while varying proportions of survival all the way from 2% to 50%, often, if you look at systematic reviews, they land around 10 to 15% neurologically intact survival. One reoccurring conclusion in these studies is the correlation between ECPR initiation time and outcomes. This is a cohort from Japan, and the graph shows the number of patients treated at different times from the arrest to ECMO initiation. You can see that when ECPR was initiated in 30 to 45 minutes, an incredible 50% had good neurological outcomes. As the delayed ECPR increases, the likelihood of a good outcome drops precipitously. <coughs> In most studies, if patients are candidate after 60 minutes of CPR, the results are dismal. While all of these studies have slightly varying inclusion criteria, they all typically require that early CPR have been performed, all have an age cutoff, and all have a list of comorbidities to include. There are some major issues with these studies. Unfortunately, they don't let us 
estimate true effectiveness or efficacy as there's no control groups in them. Secondly, patients are often cherry-picked. Although patients, institutions have a criteria, typically patients who meet the criteria of an institution but are found to be unfavorable are left out of these studies, and thus if you systematically apply certain criteria to a wide region, you may get worse outcomes. Thirdly, if you look closely at these studies, some patients actually achieve ROS and then are treated with ECMO anyways, but are still classified as eCPR patients. Thus, it's not correct to actually call them eCPR, and they may worsen overall outcomes if you excluded these patients. So I'm gonna highlight one study here, which I think is noteworthy for a number of regions. In one, they included only patients with initial shock rhythms, and beyond that, they had few criteria. They only required that the patient had no obvious non-cardiac cause and was under the age of 76. Secondly, they included a two-step evaluation, one with paramedics in the field and then one in the hospital. So paramedics activated this eCPR protocol after three unsuccessful shocks, uh, if applicable, and no ROS in the field. Then they transported to hospital. So this is the algorithm here. Uh, as I mentioned, patients were transported to hospital if they had a VF initial rhythm and they had the age cut off and no obvious cause. They then discontinued patients when they arrived at hospital if they fit the criteria of entitled CO2 under 10, PAO2 on ABG under 50, and a lactate over 18. If any one of those three were positive, they would stop, or if they found that they didn't actually meet the transport criteria. For the others, they initiated ECPR and performed immediate coronary <coughs> angiography. If they had no sustained organized electrical activity, after 90 minutes, they were declared dead, even if they were in persistent VF. And for the others, they continued echotherapy. <coughs> so they, in this study, they had 72 patients who were transported to hospital. 10 of those patients, they decided they didn't actually fit the transport criteria, so they discontinued. And then the remaining seven were discontinued based on their ABG criteria that I mentioned. Five achieved ROS, and then they put 50 patients on ECMO therapy and performed coronary angiography. They discontinued on eight patients uh, who didn't get an organized electrical activity, and then they continued on in the remaining 47. So their mean age was 58, and they had a no-flow time average of 58 minutes, which, which is quite low. <coughs> They, they stented 84% of patients, and they concluded that the majority of these patients with VF had coronary artery disease as the cause. Their mean day of ECMO was three days. Hospitals say you can see, amazingly, they had favorable neurological outcomes in 36%, and the same status at three months, which I think was a great, a great success for this program. So this and other reports of eCPR for out-of-hospital cardiac arrest are essentially single-center case studies or case series of selected patients treated for eCPR. And this, as I mentioned, the conclusions of efficacy or effectiveness are very difficult. However, these are patients who have already failed prolonged periods of conventional treatment. So do we actually need a randomized control trial looking at this therapy? Who thinks so? One, two. Who thinks we don't? Two, okay. <coughs> to shed the light on this question, we looked at 1,600 patients treated in BC. This looks like one of the graphs you saw yesterday who fulfilled our local eCPR criteria, so only patients who met our criteria, the age cutoff, witness arrest, uh, bystander CPR, or early EMS arrival. However, these patients were all treated with conventional resuscitation. And the graph demonstrates the decreasing probability of survival among those who remain in refractory arrest at increasing durations. On the y-axis, you have the probability of survival, and the x-axis, duration of resuscitation. And you can see that the likelihood of a good outcome decreases as we get further out into the, into the efforts. And at 30 minutes, the likelihood of survival in these patients was 2.5% if you remain in refractory arrest, so no pulse still. So we can compare this data to the durations of arrest, the eCPR, in previously mentioned studies, in which initiations happen somewhere between 40 and 120 minutes, suggesting that initiating eCPR at these time points is most likely beneficial if these patients have little benefit to gain from further conventional resuscitation. Some have compared the need for an eCPR RCT to, to be similar to comparing 
an RCT for dialysis or ventilation, and there might be some truth to that. However, it may be relatively clear that for a patient who's in your hospital who's already had 60 minutes of failed resuscitation, the only possible route to survival is ECMO, and I think that's true. However, the problem here for the out-of-hospital cardiac arrest is to get onto ECMO, you need to be transported to hospital. And I think every self-respecting paramedic knows that you're better off to resuscitate a patient at the scene of the crime rather than transport to hospital. Surely we know in BC, on-scene therapy is the standard policy for non-traumatic out-of-hospital cardiac arrest rather than scooping and running to hospital. But now we have ECMO, does that change things? After you've attempted resuscitation for a certain duration, should you transport to hospital or continue on-scene therapy? So to, to inform these questions and to also look for possible candidates for our potential eCPR program that we developed, we needed to figure out what the baseline outcomes of eCPR eligible patients were in Vancouver and the potential candidates. So we developed this eCPR criteria at our hospital, and then we retros retrospectively applied it to a four-year period of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, during which time there was no eCPR availability, and this yielded 168 potential candidates, 32% who remained refractory to full efforts and were declared dead in the pre-hospital or ED setting. And it's these who may have benefited from ECPR therapy. Interestingly, the outcomes of those initial shock rhythms were extremely good, with 87% achieving ROSC and surviving to a hospital admission ward. So our data led us to two observations. First, ECPR candidates with initial shock rhythms were already achieving excellent outcomes. And thus, the incremental benefit of an ECPR pre program to the health region would be relatively small, and additionally, changing the existing system, there could be a risk of worsening overall outcomes. We also realize that those who we consider the best ECBR candidates are also those who do the best outcomes with conventional resuscitation. For ECBR candidates with initial non shockable <coughs> ratio, there may be significant room to improve these outcomes, and without these patients, the program would be relatively small. And we're still struggling with the way to try and identify those with potential reversible pathology among those with initial non shockable rhythms who really have a grab bag of etiologies. So I mentioned that there was a risk of worsening outcomes when altering our existing stay in play protocols. So we needed to wrestle with the question when we were, when we were looking at an eCPR protocol development is transporting a patient to hospital with ongoing CPR detrimental to patient outcomes? If not, it wouldn't really matter. We could just transport everyone to hospital and decide who to put on ECMO once they got there. However, there are potential risks to the outcomes of these patients, chest compression fraction, but also decreasing the effectiveness of the rescuer, the additional cognitive and physical requirements of transporting a patient while doing ongoing resuscitation will likely impede the paramedic's ability to, uh, to direct energy to provide their best resuscitation effort. So we did a little bit of an aside here and we wanted to investigate the potential harms of transport to hospital during an active resuscitation effort. So we examined this question among those with refractory out of hospital cardiac arrest. What is the benefit or harm of intra-arrest transport in comparison to continued on-scene resuscitation with respect to survival at hospital discharge? And note this analysis is among those treated exclusively with conventional resuscitation, not eCPR, as it attempts to isolate the harm or benefit of transport to hospital with ongoing CPR. So we use data from the ROC, including 50,000 EMS treated out of hospital cardiac arrest without DNR orders. You can see that 12,000 of these 50 were transported to hospital with ongoing CPR. And so we identified all who were transported with ongoing CPR prior to ROS, and we categorized these patients based on their time of transport and then compared their outcomes to patients who were pulseless at the same time juncture, but were treated with on-scene conventional resuscitation until ROS or termination. For example, for a patient who was transported at 20 minutes, that patient was compared to a patient <coughs> who was receiving on-scene therapy and still pulseless at 20 minutes and continued to have on-scene therapy until termination or ROS. And then at each time juncture, we performed a separate logistic regression analysis examining the association of intra-arrest transport and survival. And so here are results among these 50,000 patients which showed that transport at all time junctures 
within the first 30 minutes was associated with worse outcomes. And beyond that, we sort of ran out of patients because more and more patients get terminated. So we weren't able to make good conclusions after that. So adding it all up, I think that eCPR likely does confer benefit after some of the prolonged attempts at CPR. We know that existing uh, outcomes of eCPR eligible patients treated with conventional resuscitation are already very good. We think that transport to hospital may impair ACLS resuscitation quality. So the next questions are, is it possible for the benefit of eCPR for those who remain pulseless to outweigh the risk of transport? And are we able to mitigate these risks? So the next step we, we wrestled with when creating this protocol was to determine the best time to transport. We already know that earlier time to ECMO is gonna have the best outcomes among those who do not ever achieve ROSC. And for these patients, rapid transport will be best. However, we also know that if you achieve early ROS with on-scene care, you'll likely have even better outcomes. So if you initiate transport early in these patients, you might worsen things. But really, at the beginning of the resuscitation, we don't know how patients are going to do with further conventional efforts. So this is the data that I showed you earlier, looking at patients who fulfilled the ECPR criteria and their likelihood of survival with time. And so we tried to figure out among this data if there was a juncture at which the likelihood of survival dropped precipitously at which time we should say this is the right time to transport as you have nothing further to gain from on-scene therapy. But really you, can, you see that, that that time period just doesn't happen, especially for those with initial shock low rhythms. You can see there's a decrease that's approximate linear as you go out to way up to 45 minutes of still potential good outcomes. For those with initial non-shock low rhythms, you can see that the outcomes are poor to begin with they still continue to get even worse. So you're already in a situation of hopelessness almost right off the bat. So mechanical CPR devices, they may play a role in maintaining resuscitation quality while en route to hospital to decrease pauses in CPR that we know occur with extrication and less so with transport. Although we have ample data now to show that mechanical CPR devices when applied widely to a EMS health system do not improve overall outcomes. They have demonstrated improved quality of CPR while transporting to hospital. And we decided when developing our protocol that it wasn't ethical for us to mandate transport to hospital for ECMO if manual CPR was going to be our only, our only route to give. To give. So in views of this uh, potential harms to the patient resuscitation and also to potential harms to paramedics, uh, we acquired Lucas chest compression devices for this purpose. So I think there are definitely risks to current outcomes when taking a successful pre-hospital system and adding an eCPR protocol. I think there are ways to mitigate this risk, firstly with acknowledging the risk exists and then carefully creating protocols such that care is altered only for those who will actually undergo ECMO initiation at hospital. We've definitely seen that an increased number of paramedics at the scene to help with patient identification and extrication and transport applying the Lucas device has been helpful with these patients in a smooth resuscitation on the run to hospital. So I'm gonna mention one other study here uh, that I thought was particularly innovative. This comes from a uh, system in Paris. As I mentioned, overall outcomes with eCPR treated patients tend to be around 50, 10 to 15% and trying to identify who among these patients will have the best outcomes to try and further refine the criteria is definitely important. So this study I thought was noteworthy in how they overcame issues of transport and also how they focused on signs of life during CPR for their criteria. So you can see their base criteria here that includes those with signs of life during CPR, hypothermia, or a combination of a healthy patient with a witness to arrest and early CPR. So they trialed this criteria on an incredible 114 patients and had only nine survivors with good neurological outcomes. You can see their arrest to ECMO durations were relatively long, and this is the metric they, they focused on, 93 minutes. So they found it quite hard to get to patients in Paris and then back to hospital in time to perform timely access to <coughs> ECMO therapy. So in phase two, they, they initiated a system where they applied ECMO at the scene of the arrest. They also focused on those with signs of life during CPR. 
This is them initiating ECMO at the scene of the arrest. And then this is a famous uh, picture in the Louvre now of them initiating ECMO with their assistants holding the flashlights. So here are some outcomes in comparison. Notable difference include a higher percentage of shock or rhythms and a high proportion of those with signs of life during CPR. They were definitely excluding other patients who didn't meet the signs of life criteria as these really make up a minority of cases with out of hospital cardiac arrest. They achieved a lower mean, low flow duration prior to ECMO initiation. And in any case, whatever they did, their outcomes demonstrated a remarkable improvement. So this is just one patient that we treated back before the start of our formal protocol, which really helped gain momentum. It was a 40 year old computer programmer, a uh, picture with permission, uh, who was started on eCPR. Things just sort of worked out as an ad hoc protocol. The surgeon was around, it was during the day, uh, and it gave us rationale to create a more formal protocol to be able to offer this service to more patients who were systematically identified. So we started our journey at St. Paul's Hospital back in 2014, first meeting with our hospital administrators who originally thought it was a crazy idea, but slowly got, got on side. We debated the pros and cons for four months and then um, finally developed a protocol and went live in January 2016. And we approached BCEHS and developed a collaborative protocol involving pre-hospital and hospital-based systems in order to achieve pre-hospital identification of patients that we thought would be eligible pre-hospital activation. So I'm gonna run you through the sequence of a protocol activation. <coughs> so after initiating resuscitation, the paramedics consider patients for the protocol after three cycles of failed resuscitation. They carry these cards and also it's on the BCVHS app that you probably all have. I won't go through in detail, but in brief, candidates are age 65 or less with no major comorbidities. If they're hypothermic or demonstrate signs of life during CPR, then they're automatically eligible. Otherwise, they need to be witnessed with either a VF initial rhythm or PEA with bystander CPR. In addition, they need to have an end CO2 over 10 and arrival at the ED under 15, 50 minutes from the 911 call, 50. So if a patient fits criteria, the paramedics place an advanced airway if not already placed already, apply the Lucas chest compression device, call the hospital to activate the protocol, and then transport with ongoing ACLS efforts. Protocol activation immediately pages the on-call CV surgeon and interventional cardiologist as well as the perfusionist while the patient is en route. And this also initiates the ED procedures for preparation to try and set up a little OR in our trauma bay. So you're not supposed to be able to actually read this, but it shows uh, the roles of the different team members. And it's a poster that hangs in our recess bay. The team uh, gathers there before the patient arrives and decides who's gonna do what. There's a preparation column and a resuscitation column there. All the equipment's organized in this two single bags. They're ready to be opened onto a sterile table. They have four machines in the back there, primed and ready to go. So patient, prior to patient arrival, the team should be organized. There's a sterile table with the cannula ready, the ECMO circuits ready, everyone knows their roles. And we hope the patient will arrive in the ED prior to 30 minutes, that'd be ideal. Typically it's closer to 50 minutes, and 50 minutes, as I mentioned, is our cutoff at which time the, the team is ready to continue resuscitation and then also a team to prep the groin for cannulation uh, and identi identify femoral vessels with ultrasound guidance. We hope that our additional team members, the surgeon and cardiologist, will arrive uh, prior to 40 minutes and then we'll have ECMO initiated within 60 minutes of the 911 call, which is our goal. So this is a protocol we activate approximately once per month. So it's definitely challenging with a large number of personnel um, who could be involved in each case. And thus each person has a low relative volume of experience. For this reason, we perform simulations once per month, which these pictures were taken involving paramedics, nurses, all the ED staff, uh, the surgeons, cardiologists. We go through the whole procedure. You can see Dr. Chung there cannulating our mannequin. Uh, and then also post ECMO care. And that's really the only way we can get experience uh, in this protocol. Uh, David Gulnick in the back there is our mannequin uh, genius. And we went through many different 
models, including these uh, Sears department store mannequins, to try and find a way we could do uh, ECMO ultrasound guided cannulation and ECMO insertion and initiation. Uh, these are the Lairdal mannequins that, we, that David Monick uh, modified. He definitely paused before putting a saw to a $10,000 mannequin, but that's what he did. And then here's our fifth generation model, which which he had designed and 3D printed, and it connects to a Laird doll, where it says the Annie doll, and you can see the ultrasound guided uh, cannulation there. So each ECBR case go, undergoes a detailed review of all time, met all time metrics, all people involved. Uh, we interviewed everyone involved for the first 20 cases to try and find out where there were ways where we could shave time off our metrics in order to decrease the time to ECMO flows. Uh, we, with our, after we did our first nine cases, uh, we published this data just looking at uh, our time to ECMO from 911 calls. That was our primary <coughs> quality improvement metric of our, of our pathway. These were four patients that we had treated with ECMO in the ED within the past like four years prior to protocol initiation, and then the nine patients uh, within the first six months of our protocol. And you can see how our time metrics changed. There's our 60 minute goal uh, after our protocol initiation. So we, I think we do need a, a randomized control trial in terms of the future on how to go with this therapy, uh, comparing the best of the best on-scene resuscitation in high-performing systems compared to transport to, to hospital of select patients at a predefined juncture for the purpose of ECPR initiation. It just so happens that this study is in the works. It's randomizing patients in Prague to, from refractory out-of-hospital cardiac arrest on-scene care versus transport to ECPR, transport to hospital for ECPR initiation. So it's on, well on its way to 170 patients. Uh, and here is some of their uh, preliminary data. It's about a bit, it's a bit of a busy slide, so I won't go into it, but they have 35% survival in their hyperinvasive arms so far. Uh, I don't have data for the survival outcomes for those with conventional resuscitation. So I think there's lots of further information, however, that we need in order to better define the optimal way to treat these patients prior to ECMO initiation and also after ECMO initiation as well. We need way better methods on trying to figure out how to identify the best patients who may benefit from eCPR, those who have surviving cerebral cells uh, with bystander CPR. We typically use Goodstein criteria, such as initial uh, cardiac rhythm, witness arrest, et cetera. However, this is a very crude measurement and patient level identification criteria, I think is what we need. Uh, however, evidence-based criteria to do this are, is currently lacking. Also, we need better strategies on how to maintain resuscitation quality during transport, and then also the best way to maintain cerebral perfusion during an active ongoing resuscitation. For those who have 45, 50 minutes of CPR, is 30 to two a better strategy? How much epinephrine should we give? When should we stop giving it? Are there any other goal-directed strategies that we could use? So conclusions, eCPR for out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, is it effective? I think for those who are not requiring transport, who've had over 45 minutes of CPR, it clearly has benefit. For those in the pre-hospital setting, is it better to stay in play or transport to eCPR? I think this is currently unclear in terms of high quality evidence. However, I think that with if you're able to minimize the detrimental effect of transport with ongoing resuscitation, if you're able to perfect this skill, uh, giving resuscitation on the run and mitigate the risks, then I think it probably does have uh, potential benefit. I think there's probably gonna be a continuing evolving and increasing role for invasive resuscitation techniques as we get better as we get more data and research on how to best optimize these techniques, however, we still have much to learn at this point. And that's just uh, one patient who we treated just uh, within the last few months who had a full neurological recovery uh, and the dispatcher there and the paramedics who uh, initiated then Dr. Bashir who uh, was uh, uh, treated him in the CSICU. So thanks for the, uh, inviting me to speak here today. And uh, my email address is on there if anyone wants to contact me later.